Hello, Thrive Nation. I have got the expert of experts on Alzheimer's disease, on mild cognitive impairment, on subjective cognitive impairment. He's an incredible, incredible researcher, medical doctor, board certified in neurology and psychiatry. It's a privilege to have him on the show. He's an author of The End of Alzheimer's and this latest book, First Survivors of Alzheimer's. Welcome to the show, Dr. Dale Bredesen. So good to be with you, Steve. Thank you. Brilliant. I want us to talk about two sort of avatars. I know in your latest book, you talk about, or even your TED Talk, we're going to put links, an incredible TED Talk, because I love the way you use biomarkers. You know, you started, does anyone know their fasting insulin? Does anyone know, you know, their different sort of markers? I think I even wrote them down, APOE genotype, even looking at your HHV6 status, your not Internal oximetry, looking at your saturation of oxygen. So amazing tech talk. We'll put it there. Well done. I, I thought it was very, very well done. But uh, give us two of these avatars now, Dr. Dale, in terms of how they improve Marcy and Edward, because I think people need to hold on to a story. Most people and most physicians are not going to believe that in the future, it's going to be the end of Alzheimer's. You've written two incredible pieces of work, lots of papers that you've done, and we're going to link to your website as well, Apollo Health, because I think it's very, very important to people to look at the data as well. But give us two incredible stories that people can relate to with regards to improving cognitive decline in Alzheimer's. Oh yeah, and then they just, th this is a new era. And so it's really difficult to get people to understand, no, it's not the way it used to be, which is the way I was trained 50 yeah. years ago. Um, it is now an era in which Alzheimer's is truly optional. As strange as that sounds, you need to get on active prevention or earliest reversals. And as you mentioned, so a couple of stories. So one of them, which is was in the book, uh, is Sally's story. And actually, she was a nursing professor who wrote to me a number of years ago. She's now seven years on the protocol. And that's another thing. I mean, when's the last time you heard of someone getting better and staying better for seven yeah. years? So most of the time, if you get a little blip at all, it's, you're going to go right back down. Mm. So she started having typical problems in her 60s. And this was problems with uh, she couldn't make a gingerbread man. She, she just couldn't organize things, which is something we hear a lot uh, in, in people who have a more of a non-amnestic presentation. She did have some memory issues. Um, she forgot to pick her granddaughters up. Uh, you know, it was a very personal story. If you know, you read those seven stories from people who went through this themselves, and if you can do it without, uh, you know, without kind of tearing up a little bit. Um, then you're then you're a pretty tough guy because yeah. it, it's amazing to hear these people and what the stories that happen to their lives. Mm. So what happened was that she now started to worry, and so she ended up going in to her you know to a regular doctor, who did a uh, who did a PET scan and said, oh yeah you yeah you have amyloid, you have Alzheimer's, and you have APOE4, which is the uh, the most common genetic risk. And it's important to point out if you have zero copies, which is three quarters of the population, your lifetime risk about nine percent. If you have one copy, your lifetime risk, and that's 75 million Americans. So it's about a quarter of the population. Now, what's the population of South Africa? About 60 million. Okay, so it's going to be about 15 million people will have this one copy. And most, of course, don't know it. Your risk is about 30% during your lifetime. Wow. And then about 7 million, so about 2% of the people in the United States will have two copies and their risk is up around 70%. It's very, unfortunately, very, very high. Uh, most, you know, most likely they will get Alzheimer's. So again, we want to get them all to find this out. Everyone keeps telling you, oh, don't bother to check. No, absolutely. Everyone should check these things and the, some of the biomarkers you mentioned. So she found out she had a single copy. So she was at high risk uh, and she then um, started going downhill. Um, she then went on a drug trial where an antibody, just like the antibodies that were just recently approved uh, here in the States, uh, over a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of objections, yeah. uh, she went on one of those. And each time she would get in injected, which was once a month, she would get worse. So after it took her eight injections, because most of these people say, well, you know, the doctors know what they're doing, so I won't, yeah. uh, I won't try to interfere. Finally, after eight injections, each time what had happened, she'd get worse, and then she'd slowly start to get better. And then the month would be up, and then boom, she'd get worse again. And we've had people like that who just saw tooth down for a couple of years. It was horrible. So she then uh, got, got worse, uh, and so she had a MOCA score of 24. Now, 24 out of 30 is typical for 
uh, MCI, mild cognitive impairment. Yeah. So that's the third stage already of Alzheimer's. Yeah. You have the pre-symptomatic stage. You have the SCI stage, as you mentioned earlier, which lasts about 10 years. Then you have the MCI stage, and then 5 to 10% of the MCI convert to full-on dementia each year. So that's what she was staring. By the time you get to 22, 21, and especially for someone who did a lot of schooling, for her to be all way down at 24 already, she was very affected. And so she quit the trial. I got an email from her and said, you know, would you work with my doctor? So we worked together to get the right things. She had multiple things that we found that we identified were driving this. And again, that's the new medicine. You don't simply make a diagnosis. You say, why? And I should add one other thing. For people with normal cognition, great. This approach makes your cognition better. So it's not just people who truly have Alzheimer's. It's people who are every day, maybe not be as sharp as they should be. So we addressed all the different things in her cases, and she started getting better. And actually, she is in a documentary, and I hope it's going to be in South Africa. It's mm. just opened in New York City, um, which is which is called Memories for Life Reversing Alzheimer's. Wow. And it talks to a number of patients, and it shows what, what we've been up to and talks about this kind of the beginning of reversal of cognitive decline. Uh, and uh, so very excited about that. And it's right now it's touring around the United States and then it will be on streaming. Uh, not clear yet whether it's going to be Netflix, whether it's going to be something else. Uh, but uh, but in any case, that's the idea. So she got better. She went from 24 to 30. Perfect wow. score. Uh, and she has stayed well for seven years. Now, interestingly, as with some others, she had a little bit of backsliding lately. When we see that, we then find out, okay, what's been missed? So the, the point is, this disease is no longer a mystery. Yeah. It's not, I mean, that's what we spent the 30 years in the lab and published 230 papers to understand what actually drives this process. And if you look under the hood, what you see is that what we call Alzheimer's is a network insufficiency. In other words, you have this beautiful, amazing neuroplasticity network with about 500 trillion synapses. You got a supercomputer inside your skull. Over time, if you don't get enough oxygenation, if you don't get enough blood flow, if you don't get enough mitochondrial function, if you don't get enough ketones, so the, the, the brain can only metabolize ketones or glucose, and you should be able to go back and forth. And that's another important point because these people typically lose both of those. Wow. And we can talk about biochemically why that is. And so now you have an energetic problem. And so what your brain goes into a protective mode. And that was what were the finding we had in the lab over the years was that there is this beautiful cellular signaling. When things are good, just like for your country, you know, your chancellor or your prime minister or your president says things are good. Yeah. We're going to build and maintain. And that's exactly what your brain says. And on, in fact, it, you can see that you actually get specific cleav cleavage patterns that are associated with building and maintenance. Now, you're saying the same brain now says, uh oh, if I've got invaders and that is various pathogens, various toxins. If I've got too little energetics, as we just talked about, if I've got too little trophic support, and that's growth factors like nerve growth factor, and it's hormones like uh, like estradiol and, and testosterone and progesterone, pregnenolone and thyroid, and then it's also nutrients, any of those things, then what's gonna happen is you're going to switch your signaling just as we did, just as we saw in the pandemic, you know, what happened during the pandemic? Our politicians and, and our governors told us, hey, we've been uh, we have been invaded in this case by SARS-CoV-2. So we're going to go in a, to a protective downsizing mode. You're going to shelter in place. You're going to mm. socially distance. You're not going to go to work, all that stuff. And of course, we, the world went into a recession. Yeah. And, you know, that certainly happened here in the States. Sure. Uh, and so I'm gonna, excuse me one second. I'm going to put my dog down here. My dog was w working with me here and he decided he wants <laughs> to draw up. <laughs> no problem. But that would be a good place to start. Uh, you know, I printed yeah. out this marker 
Yeah, you can't actually see it. Maybe I should do that over there. Oh, I can but see it. Yeah, you've got the mocha, yeah, the mocha score. Yeah, the mocha score. I think it's a great test because I think people are listening and it's a great, really good story about Sally and they're thinking, okay, where do I start? Yeah. And I want to go through all the diagnostic tests because I think that's fundamentally important in terms of what people can do, where they should start. Now, this test over here, I looked at it. Is there a time basis? I know they can find it online. I just literally printed it out. Should everybody start looking at doing that test? And how long have they got to do the test? Yeah, first of all, there, there is no time limit. Okay. Uh, but it typically takes people about 12 minutes or so. Um, okay. And you want to have someone administer it to you. And okay. what they've been suggesting just over the last few years is that someone actually get certified in administering the MOCA. Well, okay. Um, if you're talking about, you know, you're, you're going to do this for a clinical trial, that's one thing. But just for all of us, there is a simple free online cognitive assessment that everybody should do. And that's called CQ, C, and then a little Q, okay. kind of like IQ, but this is CQ. So your cognitive quotient, basically. Um, and you can go on uh, and look for this. You can go on. In fact, you can go on the internet and look at my cognoscopy. So okay. what we point out is, look, everybody who turns 40 should now look at, just like we know, when you turn 50, what do you do? You get a colonoscopy. And actually, uh, my wife and I decided years ago we would have his and hers on Valentine's Day just to get it over with. And I can guarantee you a cognoscopy is a lot more pleasant than a colonoscopy. <laughs> very sure. easy to do. Yeah. So they can do easy. this, they mocha, they can do this, and then they can do the CQ, cognitive quotient, get a cognoscopy. I think they can yeah. also go to your website. I think you offer a test, don't you, there? Because, I mean, you said the average age of someone living with dementia is 49. I mean, that is, like, really low, a lot lower than people would, like, even think. So can they go to your website to do the CQ, or should yeah. they do the mocha? What should, where should they start? Yeah, the easy thing to do is just go to the website and do the CQ. I think that's the easiest thing to do for people. Um, you know, it's free, it's quick, and then you can kind of see where you stand. And often people are a bit surprised. And the reason is because changes sneak up on us. We often go for many years knowing that things aren't quite perfect, but, you know, hey, I can still get along. Yeah, well, you can still do your job, but you may not be able to do it as well as you used to do it, as well as you'd like to do it. So in fact, you can do this to, to make sure that you're you're up to snuff. And as I mentioned earlier, this approach will help people who are normal in their cognition to be better, essentially to be optimal for themselves. Mm -hmm. Because this thing does sneak up on you, as I mentioned earlier, these you know, four phases. If we could get everybody to come in for prevention or for during the SCI phase, which as I mentioned, lasts about 10 years, there would be very, it would be a rare disease that you would actually get dementia associated with Alzheimer's. Getting dementia is a very, very late stage. And as has been shown very nicely by serial PET scans and serial spinal fluid analysis, by the time you get a diagnosis of dementia associated with Alzheimer's, typically you've had the underlying problems for 20 years. Okay. So there is stuff going on. And again, what's happening is, you are your brain has been responding, saying, I'm not really getting enough sleep. I'm not really getting enough support. I'm, I'm getting too much stress. It's literally a supply and demand. The supply is a little down. The demand is a little high because of all the stress, because of all the infections, the toxin ex exposure, things like that. So what's happening when you don't have this, the supply to meet the demand, the only thing you can do is start to downsize. And that's, we believe that that is what these various neurodegenerative diseases, be it Alzheimer's or ALS or frontotemporal dementia or Lewy body, it just go on and on and on, that these are fundamentally represent network insufficiencies. And that therefore you need for each of these, it's going to be a different network. There are multiple yeah. neural sub networks. You know, it's all about neuroplasticity in Alzheimer's. It's all about motor control in Parkinson's disease. It's all about motor power in ALS. So yeah. you've got these different subsystems. And interestingly, each one has a different supply and demand. Yeah. And each one has a different Achilles heel. As we know, for example, Parkinson's, the Achilles heel is very clear, mitochondrial complex one. So it's a specific group of proteins within your mitochondria. You simply inhibit that, 
you get Parkinson's. Yeah. So all the different toxins that are giving this to you, and by the way, Parkinson's is really on the way up, mm. uh, as uh, Dr. Ray Dorsey and his colleagues yeah. showed in, in their nice book, a prescription for ending Parkinson's. Yeah. So th you know this is a big issue, and so it these is. different ones. Were, by the way, we're also doing uh, macular degeneration. So um, we, I believe now, and we are just opening the first precision medicine program for mm. neurodegenerative disease. We're mm. doing this in LA, so it should be open within the next several months. I'm very enthusiastic about that because it's something that's needed. You know, if you get mm. any one of these diseases today. There's very little that can be done, as you know, mm. from Alzheimer's, from Lewy yeah. body, from PSP, and on and on. So, well, that's, yeah. why that's why I salute you, because we need to get your work out to more physicians, more neurologists. You know, I've been doing functional medicine for 17 years, looking at root wow. cause diseases. You know, I fitted yeah. my first lecture on vitamin D in 2006. Yeah. So I've been really sort of trumpeting this call of looking at root cause diseases. And unfortunately, in my perspective, neurologists and psychiatrists are very difficult to deal with with regards to functional medicine and the body of evidence that there is. But having yep. said that, the person does the CQ. They do this cognoscopy. Where do yep. they go then? Because now we are teaching, you know, Mate is Tribe is now so many podcasts, you know, the tribe is growing. We want to teach them possibly the 10 top blood tests to do with regards to, you know, neurodegenerative conditions. Or do they get a sleep tracker? What does Dr. Dale say about REM sleep, deep sleep? Is that the next step? Or do they see a functional medicine doctor and look at apolipoprotein B, look at their lipogram, make sure they understand their lipid profile, make sure they understand uric acid. We had Dr. David Pilmada on the show talk about uric acid. What is the next step? Someone's done the test. Where do they go? Great point. So one of two places. If you are asymptomatic, you scored well on the test, you're, you're not having problems, then you can do this with a health coach. You don't need to go to a physician. Now, we've trained over 2,000 physicians uh, in 10 countries, including South Africa, uh, and uh, all over the world, all over the U.S. So um, you can simply uh, look that up, and you can go, literally go, we have a little tool. You go on the Apollo uh, Apollo Health website. Again, you can get through it through drbredesen.com or through mycognoscopy.com, and just use the thing that says, you know, look up, is there a physician near me? And you can search the world over, and you can see who's the closest one to you. Um, you can also go to, you know, there are other places in yeah. Europe and things like that if you don't want to do it locally. Um, so that's so if you if you are asymptomatic and doing well, it's up to you. You can go in or not. And so when you get your cognoscopy, it's a simple three part thing. You're going to get a uh, you're going to get some some standard blood tests. And it's going to be blood tests that your doctor often won't do. So it's going to be things like looking at your, uh, you know, looking at your HSCRP, your homocysteine, all the things that actually drive the decline, your fasting insulin, your various hormonal status, your various toxin status. And then we have an algorithm, a computer-based algorithm that will now spit out, okay, here are the things that are <clears throat> driving you and are you most at risk for one subtype or another? <clears throat> we see people who are more inflammatory. We see people who are more, uh, who are more atrophic, people who are more toxic, people who are more vascular. So you can look at the subtypes. Now, so that's that's an easy thing to do. And there are lots of great health coaches all over the world who can work with you to make sure you optimize those things. And, you know, it's just amazing. I just got another email. We get these almost every day now. Uh, one of my old friends from college, who is a very, very smart guy, um, spent his career uh, working with computers, a great guy. Uh, and, you know, was having some issues. And, you know, in, in fact, his electrophysiology showed it. Um, doing his cognoscopy showed what were the issues. Um, now he's months into this. He's changed the basic things. And in fact, you can see his scores have gone up. Um, his metabolic parameters have gone up. He's literally gone from having metabolic syndrome to not having metabolic syndrome. And as you know, Having metabolic syndrome is increases your risk for cognitive decline. You've got issues with diabetes. You've got issues with vascular disease and on and on. So seeing this turnaround is, is important. Now, if you now, go I'm to the- stop you. I'm going to stop you there with yeah. the blood test. I think it's very important. Are you saying the most important is 
the inflammatory markers, your HSCRP, your interleukin-6, your interleukin-10. Are you looking at inflammation being the most important you look at? Or are you looking at your HOMA index? Are you looking at you know, your hbl one c your apolipoprotein B, ferritin levels, fibrinogen levels? I mean, I've seen just in the last three years, I've seen fibrinogen increase to such a degree that I am shocked at what's happening with fibrinogen levels. I've seen yeah. ferritin levels escalate at another level from inflammatory uh, sort of um, conditions in the human state. So what are the most important? I mean, even uric acid, if people get these blood tests down, I mean, sometimes it's resource dependent. What are your top sort of markers that you look at when it comes to Alzheimer's? Such a good point. And this is a critical point. So you've mentioned a few where you're kind of going to the second level. What we have to do is you have to remember, this is ultimately a network insufficiency. So we want to look at your supply we want to look at your demand. Your supply is largely about your blood flow and it's about your oxygenation. So you want to know, is someone getting some sleep apnea? We want to look at your nocturnal SpO2, which by the way, is a beautiful predictor of brain size. You start shrinking your brain as your SpO2 is going down at night. And then we want to look at the you know, your mitochondrial function. Then we want to look at the demand. And so things like do you have increased demand because of inflammation? Do you have toxins that are suppressing your ability to meet that demand? So this is a complex system that is driving your cerebral function. And unfortunately for many of us, it's not quite hitting on all cylinders as you're getting past 40, which is why we recommend everyone check it out. So what you do is you do a first level view of all of those things. So you're looking at your HSCRP. That's one of the most important. You are looking at your HOMA IR. So you're going to look to see, does someone have insulin resistance? And of course, that is, that is going to include a fasting insulin. You are looking at your you are looking at your uh, homocysteine, another good marker. You mentioned ferritin. Of course, you're looking at ferritin as well, which typically goes up with inflammation. You don't necessarily have to start with IL-6 and IL-10 and things like that. That's the second level. So what you do is you start by getting that first level to give you a lay of the land to say, okay, is the main driver here more on the inflammatory side, more on the atrophic side? You know, your hormones are all low, your vitamin D is low, your trophic factors are low. Is it more on the glycotoxic side? You know, you've got a high HOMA IR, maybe you have metabolic syndrome. There are, there are about 80 million Americans who have metabolic syndrome. By the way, the guy I just told you about, uh, my old college friend, uh, you know, had liver damage, you could see as well as part of his overall metabolic syndrome. And of course, it's what we used to call NASH. Uh, now called NAFLD, which I think yeah. is not as easy to, to say as NASH. Uh, <laughs> so, so I like yeah. the idea of NASH. Um, it, his was abnormal, and it's an incredibly common problem uh, in the Western world. And so you you know you damage your liver as you get into this metabolic decline. His is completely completely healed up beautifully. Sure. So yeah. as you know from being in functional medicine for seventeen years. These metabolic and toxic and bacteriological and gut related, these are these um, systems are systems that go awry and that have beautiful reversibility. So this old idea, you know, people when I first sent the first paper we published was back in 2014, showing reversal of cognitive decline. And people just said it's impossible. If anyone had reversed cognitive decline in Alzheimer's, it would be in all the papers around the world. Well, you know, maybe it should have been. We're doing it again. We've got thousands of people now who've been on this. But just as you said, the neurologists will say, no, I, I can't believe it. That's not possible because they're still looking at this as the old fashioned way of, oh, there's a misfolded protein. Let's remove the misfolded protein. Well, why do you think that's there? It's, it's part of this overall network alteration. And by the way, you know, we came to this originally because we were studying the cellular and molecular signaling of amyloid precursor protein, APP, which is the thing associated with Alzheimer's disease. It's the parent of the little hunk of, of peptide, which makes amyloid. And so what we found is this thing is a remarkable molecular switch 
when things are good, it's on the good side, it's being cut at one site, it's telling you, yes, grow, make synapses, maintain synapses. When things are bad, you have infections, you've got poor dentition, all these things that are getting into your brain, it goes into a protective downsizing mode, again, just as the, our countries did during the pandemic, and it now makes the amyloid, which guess what? Kills bacteria, it kills fungi, it kills viruses. So you can see why this stuff is made. You're not making it to give yourself Alzheimer's, yeah. making it to protect yourself. Yeah. But of course, it's one of the things it's doing is saying you can't support a brain with 500 trillion synapses. Exactly. So you have to find out those things, look at them. And that's why we do the first layer of tests. Then okay. the idea is you look to see which ones are abnormal because you don't need to do the second layer on everybody. Mm. That's going to be you know, you're going to end up with a million dollar workup. You don't need Now, that. before you get there, I just want to make a comment. So the amyloid beta is actually a downstream effect of what's actually happening from a biochemical aspect in your brain. It's the body's response to what's actually happening. Absolutely. Um, it is a response. And it's quite an important one because it is an antimicrobial peptide. It is protecting you. And no surprise, we've seen a number of people uh, who, as I mentioned earlier for Sally, went, went in and as they started to remove the amyloid, they got worse. So yeah. when you're removing that, it's very much like removing a protective cytokine. So if you go back again to the pandemic, so there's some beautiful analogies here. So you go to the pandemic, what did people die of? People died of cytokine storm. Oh. You had the insult but in fact, it turns out that SARS-CoV-2 has specific mechanism to prevent you from an early response, which is why basically your body does okay for a little while. And then ultimately it recognizes it. Oh my gosh, it's everywhere. So you just pour out these cytokines, of course, trying to kill the virus, but they are damaging to your body as well. And you end up dying from cytokine storm. In Alzheimer's, the same thing happens, yeah. but we die from cytokine drizzle. It's just perking along. Your HSCRP is often a little high. Your microglia in your brain are activated. You are activating this because you are trying to clean up this problem. So again, the idea of let's just shut down the response is a 20th century yeah. naive view. Mm. What we want to determine is what are you responding to? Unlike in the pandemic where we were all responding to one virus, you can be responding to dozens and dozens of different things. Yeah. So you got to turn you got to figure those out. Is this P gingivalis from your oral microbiome? Is this a leaky gut? Is this chronic sinusitis? Is this metabolic syndrome? Yeah. Is this toxin exposure? So we're looking initially across at all of these. That's the first layer. Then, yeah, then, then that's the first layer. Then if you find, ah, here's the problem with this person, then you're going to focus in on that. And then you're going to do additional tests in that area. So when you then start to improve, let's talk about that. There's specifics and then there's some basics. The basics are seven things. So it turns out, as you know, that diet, exercise, sleep, stress, brain training, detox, and some basic targeted supplements. That's the way to start for everybody because that's what's going to optimize your support. You are going to return the normal support to your remarkable synaptic uh, network. And then with that, and you know, again, when I was training in medical school and in residency and in fellowship, there was no belief that things like diet had any any effect mm. on on the on brain disease. It was all about, you know, let's find out what's the problem and let's write a prescription for it, yeah. which unfortunately simply hasn't worked for Alzheimer's disease. And again, yeah. it's because people are thinking about it the wrong way. When you fix a network that is out of kilter from a number of things, you don't hit it with a hammer. You go in and you tweak a little here, you tighten a little screw here, you know, you tweak here, you tweak that, and you get the thing slowly working back. You're out there doing appropriate exercise, getting a, into appropriate ketosis. You're literally providing the energetics that your brain has been lacking typically for years. Mm. 
then the second stage is what are the specifics? Okay. If you have a good example, we just had a person who, who's done beautifully uh, in from New York, and this is uh, from the the wonderful the wonderful health coach uh, Carrie Mills Rutland, and this this is one example of many many hundreds and thousands, and we've published you know uh, we've published over a hundred of these so far, more more to come, or uh, in any case, we've published actually several hundred, but more to come. But uh, in her case, it turned out this is a one woman, for example, who's done beautifully, and her MRI just shows dramatic improvements in her volumetrics. But she had Bartonella, so that's a tick-borne yeah. illness. She also had herpes simplex, which, and by the way, uh, Professor Professor Ruth uh, Itzaki from the UK has spent her career showing the relationship between herpes and cognitive decline and showing that this is a very common and very important risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Again, why? Because Alzheimer's is about a response to these various pathogens, toxins, metabolic changes, et cetera. So she had that as well. That's now been treated. She also turned out to have mycotoxins. So when you get toxin exposure, which of course damages your mitochondria, it's the very thing that you can use to both turn down your energetics. And by the way, because it's biotoxins, you're now also gonna be inflammatory. Just as Dr. Richie Shoemaker taught all of us years ago, this is chronic inflammatory response yeah. syndrome. It is a chronic inflammatory response. So she had all of those. She also began for energetics to do EWOT, which is exercise with oxygen mm -hmm. therapy. And again, you improve your energetics, she started getting much, much better. So again, you have to ferret out those critical drivers yes. and you have to improve the synaptic network support. And doing that, you see improvements. Good. Now, I want to just sort of make a comment and let me know what you think about this is, have you not really proven how important functional medicine is? Because there are so many physicians that don't look at root causes. You know, I've done a lot of podcasts and they say, well, vitamin D hasn't been shown to reduce like cancer risk or this hasn't done that or this hasn't done. Have you not in writing this book and the papers you've done shown how important these key important drivers are? They're very unique. They're very bespoke to the individual client and patient. Right. Some of them are inflammatory, some of them are glycolytic, some of them are toxin-based. It's very specific. But once you remediate those causative factors, you see significant changes, which you have now shown and proven. And I think according to your study, 84% showed a significant change. Have you now not demonstrated how important functional medicine is? Well, and of course, Jeffrey Bland, the, the grandfather of functional medicine, and many of the trainees he's had, and I think they've had over 10,000 physicians who've now trained, mm -hmm. I think have been showing this for years, uh, to, to improve rheumatoid arthritis, to improve leaky gut, to improve in our own daughter, to improve lupus, on and on and on. But, you know, it's interesting. Go to Wikipedia, look up functional medicine. And what it says is that this is some crackpot alternative medicine that is, you know, that is based on a lie. I mean, what, it's so ridiculous. And yet virtually every day we read that some mainstream medicine has just discovered yeah. that vitamin D uh, is, is preventive for Alzheimer's disease, yeah. um, has just discovered that the gut microbiome is important. I mean, yeah. all the things that functional medicine and to be fair, naturopathic medicine as well, yeah. have been touting for decades and yet you look it up in Wikipedia that's supposed to be a good source and they're telling you that this stuff mm. is alternative crackpot medicine. So it's amazing. I just actually posted something on Facebook that got a lot of comments about this very issue. We should be, you know, Wikipedia and all of us should be waking up to the fact that medicine is, is changing. This is 21st century medicine. And, you know, this is part of a bigger story, but, you know, I love your point. This is part of a bigger story. We have practiced a form of medicine for centuries, and especially within the last century, where we believe we can take a complex system like the, like the human body and the human organism with human physiology, 
and we can boil down a diagnosis to one single small molecule, and we're going to write you a prescription for an antihypertensive yeah. or for an anti-diabetic medicine, and that that's going to take care of this. It's it's as if you said, you know, our country is failing. We're not able to keep the invaders out. Um, we're you know we're in the we're in the red. Or, or we can't balance our budget. Things are falling apart. So you know what. What one thing are we going to do? We're, you know, we're just going to, okay, we're going to mint a new coin of the realm and that's going to fix everything. Yeah. No, no it doesn't you. work that way. So what you have to do, this is now complex chronic illness medicine. It is age related. It's lifespan medicine. It's health span medicine. It's why we're going to do better and better mm. with health span and lifespan, looking at all the different things. And it's amazing to me that, you know, in Silicon Valley, everyone takes it for granted. You want larger data sets. If you're going to make these large networks, if you're going to create Twitter and you're going to create Google and you're going to create things like that, of course, you are manipulating these very complex data sets. Yeah. If you're going to send a man to the moon or a woman to the moon, you're going to have to do the same yeah. thing. Why is it that we doctors have been so silly to think that we're mm. going to write a little prescription yeah. and that's going to fix everything? Yeah. The no, world true. does not work that way. But I think, uh, you know, and one of your friends that uh, Peter Tier talks about the four horsemen, if you look at cardiovascular disease, you look at cancer, neurodegenerative and metabolic disease, you look at those four, it seems like you've hit the nail on the head when it comes to functional medicine. It seems like now you have changed neurodegeneration, you know, this condition to such a degree where it doesn't seem like it's the same from a functional medicine perspective for cardiovascular disease or cancer and or metabolic disease so it seems like you've really been able to prove this because there's so many times you speak to physicians neurologists psychiatrists to really prove that functional medicine has significant effects so once again well done to you i do want to Thank talk you. about further tests i want to talk because there is some discrepancy from some of the heroes i listen to in terms of essential fatty acids how important EPA and DHA is. There's some real controversy. I think it's fundamentally important. I've seen it empirically, how important it is having a look at people with regards to the consumption of saturated fats. You know, sometimes the apolipoprotein B really increases. What is your overall view? And I know the literature is sometimes sketchy on DHA and EPA with regards to brain uh, sort of function. In terms of Alzheimer's, should re people really be concerned about the essential fatty acids? It's a great point. And so you're right. There is controversy. So, so at least so what I love about the controversy is at least people have said, you know what, this is a complex system. We better start wading in there. We better see how this organism is functioning. We better know these various parameters. And just you mentioned some of them. Uh, but yes, as so, so we want to know, again, to look at this synaptic plasticity. We want to know, first of all, do you have enough DHA? So, and this is the work of Professor Richard Wortman for many, many years at MIT, who showed that if you add DHA and you add citicoline, so you're looking at a CDP choline, these actually help for new synapse formation. And of course, he did this work in, mostly in rodents, but they have translated some of this. So again, we're just translating all this beautiful lab work into here's what actually works. The big surprise to me as a classically trained scientist and neurologist, I thought we were going to come up with here at the end, at the end of all of our studies, we're going to come up with, aha, here is the prescription we need. No, what it showed is that the medicine I was taught way back in the 1970s and 80s is fundamentally flawed for complex chronic illness. Great for someone with pneumococcal pneumonia. We give you some amoxicillin, you're all good to go, or some cephalosporin, whatever you want to use, good to go. But for complex chronic illness, these are networks. And so you have to look at the different things. So it really showed me that what I call precision medicine or functional medicine or integrative medicine, or as Lee Hood points out, P4 medicine, as he as he dubbed it. And I should mention, um, Lee has a, a, a very nice book. And Lee is, 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 a, is a role model for all of us. He's the one that invented the DNA sequencers um, that were used in the human genome. I mean, he changed the whole face of biology and bioengineering. He absolutely deserves a Nobel Prize without question. And he's come out with a recent book 
I mean, he actually mentions in the book a discussion that, that he and I had about uh, what to do about Alzheimer's disease. And as he points out, amyloid, just as you were mentioning a few minutes ago, it's a great biomarker because it tells you, ah, your brain has been assaulted and you are responding. But it is a horrible therapeutic target because it's it's a response. And in fact, it's a protective response. The trick is, yes, it is associated with some downsizing. So you're really playing with fire if you're just going to remove the amyloid. It's a little bit like, imagine that you had a crime wave in your town. So you're bringing in the police. And so there's shooting going on. There's crime going on. Whoa. And so you say, wait a minute, I'm just going to send all the police home because then there just won't be as many bullets flying. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly what you're doing when you're getting rid of amyloid. And sure, you may do okay for a short period of time, but you're going to have the problem that started it continuing. Mm. So it's a very naive 20th century view of what to do with Alzheimer's. Yeah, and that's sure. why, as you know, you look at the results of these anti-amyloid antibodies. They're horrible. Yeah. They don't make you better. They don't keep you the same. In the best case scenario, they slow the decline by a little bit. But of course, those people are now at risk for further things. Yeah. So, but comment so on this EPA DHA, because we do the testing on a daily basis. Oh. How important is that? Because some physicians are saying it's not important. And even linoleic acid, you know, some people are saying that is more important to get the LA down than to improve EPA, DHA. Yep. Where do you stand on that? Well, so where I stand is, you know, again, I'm interested in the biochemistry of it. These are all important for different reasons. So I like to know an omega-3 index. That's a beginning. Um, are you at, I'd like to see at 10%. If you're sitting down around 5%, 6%, you probably don't have enough omega-3s. And then, yes, I'd like to know, uh, I'd also like to know how much total you know, DHA that you've got there. Do you have enough? Do you have, and then of course, I'd like to know uh, your, your ratio. Uh, that's important. And there's, you know, some people like to look at arachidonic acid to EPA ratio, because that's a very nice way to look at inflammation. So each of these is giving you slightly complementary information. So sure, in a perfect world, you would get all of these and you'd also look at linoleic acid. Of course, as it's been pointed out, that's a, a particularly damaging omega-6. So there are lots of ways to go at this. Mm. Um, the arachidonic acid, of course, highly pro-inflammatory. So all of these things are complementary. But what's interesting, what's been pointed out, and actually my wife, who is a, uh, who is a, uh, an integrative physician, pointed out that, look, you know, you can look at all these things, but what you won't really want to know now is ApoB, because you really want to know th this is kind of takes into account all of the different atherogenic okay. particles. Now, okay. I still want to know, are you, even if you've got a low atherogenic particles, I'd still like to know, do you have enough DHA, especially okay. I'm interested in DHA, uh, which is a you know a long chain omega three because it is so important for your synapses, okay. and if you don't have enough, you're not going to be as good at making and keeping synapses as we'd like you to be. Okay. So yeah, so I like the ratios, um, and then another a simple one for people who have gotten a standard test and just want to know well, you know what's my risk. At least look at your triglyceride to HDL ratio. That's another good one. Now the one caveat with that is we've seen people with toxin exposure who drop their triglycerides. It appears to be part of an overall, interestingly, an an inflammatory response, and this has been published a couple of times in the past by one particular group studying this and showing that yes, with lupus, with many of these autoimmune related diseases, you do get this drop in triglycerides. Mm. So, um, and this seems That's to be simple. from a change in activity of lipoprotein lipase. So, okay. um, so, That's so, important. so you know, it's not, again, it's not so simple as I just do one thing, but if sure. you're going to just do one thing, then I would check your yeah. ApoB, yeah. but make okay. sure to include inflammatory looks yeah. in there as well. Look, also we've been doing now amino acid testing. I don't know what you think about yeah. this. It's been a game changer for my patients. I'd love to know. I'd, I'd love to find an expert to talk into this because I've never seen such low arginine. I've never seen such low lysine. You know, these important yeah. amino acids are, and then people are taking collagen filled with proline and glycine, and then they're getting high levels. What is your view on amino acid testing with regards to Alzheimer's? 
Such a good point, because again, we're talking about an insufficiency. So yes, absolutely, we would like to know. Now, you can do other things to look at you know, nutrients. So we typically look at gut, we look at a sort of, you know, a GI effects sort of test. If everything's good there, we usually don't push it to that next level. But again, anything that's suspicious, you want to take it to that next level. So yes, this is a result of the fact that most of us eat muscle. And of course we don't, and again, as my wife pointed out to me, uh, and and you know, she's the one that over 20 years ago, when we were starting these experiments in the lab and looking at, I said, you know, we're gonna find that one critical molecule for Alzheimer's and we're gonna get one drug that changes one fold of one molecule and we're gonna cure Alzheimer's. And she said, no, it's not going to be that simple. You're going to find that some basic things like, you know, exercise, all the things that uh, that I, as a reductionist, didn't mm. even want to think about. Uh, and she was right. You know, I should have listened to her a long time ago okay. because uh, that's exactly after all this hard work. This is what we came to understand. Yeah. So eating nose to tail is a better way to go. And of mm. course, many people have pointed this out. And of course, the vast majority of us aren't eating mm. organ meats and things like yeah. that. So you're going to have to look at your amino acids and you're going to have to look at what am I missing? And of course, it's why so many of us are indeed taking collagen protein. Yeah. Okay, so good. So amino acids are important. There are no specific amino acids that would be like a real mark for Alzheimer's or cognitive decline that has been shown over all your patients. You can't comment specifically on that. No, in fact, I would say uh, if you want to look at the most important nutrients to know about in Alzheimer's disease, I would start with choline because choline is low in so many people. Uh, and choline is, you know, you're, you're probably best to get around 550 milligrams per day. Uh, and most of us are getting, you know, 400 or 350 or that sort of thing to make enough acetylcholine, which is the most important neurotransmitter for memory, you need to have an appropriate choline uptake and intake. Then I would go to, from there, I would go to omega-3s. And again, if you look at the, at, at the amyloid that we associate with this, it is part of your innate immune system, but it is especially part of your innate immune system memory. It used to be thought that your adaptive immune system has a beautiful memory, but your innate system didn't. It turns out it does have a memory. Of course, it's less specific than your adaptive system memory. And your innate system memory, and this was pointed out to me by Dr. Alexei Karakin, who's an interactomics expert, lives in three sites. Number one is your bone marrow. So you're a, literally, you're gonna come out more. This is again, goes back to the cytokine storm issue. If you're always on high alert because you're eating too much linoleic acid, you're not getting enough omega-3s, you're going to respond to any sort of pathogen. You're going to hyper respond, which is just going to give you more damage. So we want to bring that inflammation down. Get We'd like to see your, you know, your, your six to three ratio being more like one or two or three or four, not 15, wow. uh, not a half. But not fifteen, yeah. but right, you know, one to four range in there somewhere. Mm. And let's so talk, let's let's talk about sleep, so, Doctor Dale. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. You can finish there, but I think mm -hmm. REM sleep and deep sleep, these wearables, or doing a sleep yes. study at home is is this. I know they're not totally accurate, but they could be precise, making the same errors. We, you know, we focus on REM sleep. Can you sort of explain how important quality sleep is to preventing and and your recode program? that you've put in place that has really changed and improved people's quality of life with how does sleep sort of uh, form part of that? Oh, absolutely. And as the first, those first seven that I mentioned, the, the thing, you know, diet, exercise, sleep, stress, et cetera. So absolutely sleep is an important and undervalued part of that. There was a, um, there was a study years ago where people just looked at your SpO2 during your sleep. So what's your oxygen saturation while you're sleeping? And it correlates beautifully with the size of your hippocampus and other nuclei in the brain. So it's hugely important. We'd like to see people getting at least one hour of deep sleep. We'd like to see people getting at least an hour and a half of REM sleep. And we'd like to see people getting at least a total of seven to eight hours of sleep per night. And yes, you start to go up to nine to 10, that's also associated with cognitive decline. 
So, of course, the many people I see are more like, you know, four hours, five hours. Yeah. They're, you know, they're just trying to, to push, push, push. And absolutely, and there have been numerous, numerous papers showing the relationship of good quality sleep to reducing risk for cognitive decline. There's just no question. And unfortunately, reduced sleep increases your risk for making the amyloid and having Alzheimer's. And doing that actually reduces your ability to get good quality sleep. So it's unfortunately a prionic loop. It just keeps feeding forward, feeding forward. So absolutely, you need to kind of reset and get back. So just as we're resetting your immune system, not to be on high alert, and I should have mentioned, you know, the, the, it's bone marrow, it's tissue macrophages, and it's endothelial cells where okay. that lives. And so uh, quality sleep is huge. And, you know, you can argue that sleep is the most important or that exercise is the most important or that a plant-rich, mildly ketogenic diet is the most important. Whatever you argue, um, these things are all critical to, again, to restoring support of your synaptic network. Mm. Let's talk about nutrition as we come to the end, because you said plants rich ketogenic diet. And I find that some people, unfortunately, if they're on the ketogenic diet, their lipids go in the wrong direction. I'm concerned about that. Plant rich, yes. obviously, with the polyphenols and the flavonoids, how important that is. You know, should people stay away from grass fed, grass finished, you know, meat? I find that we've got a protein crisis, you know, following the work of Peter Tia. I can't even sum that get the protein I need based on two grams of protein per kilogram. I mean, it's it's a real That's problem amazing. trying to get this in. I mean, so I'm fit, I'm strong, 24 years of practice, never missed a single day's work ever to sickness, wow. ill health or disease, you know, run multiple comrades, marathons, 40,000 Ks on the clock. So I've got these numbers, I've got this data, and I'm battling to understand exactly how people get their protein consumption being on a sort of plant-rich ketogenic diet. Great point. Um, and so it depends again on where, you know, what your goal is. And again, it's very important. I'm not talking about a standard ketogenic diet. Okay. Um, and as you said, you can have lipid problems, you know, all sorts of issues there. But what has worked the best? And again, I, you know, I'm agnostic. I, I'm not a nutritionist. <laughs> I just want to know what makes the biochemistry of your synapses work the best. Yes. So far, what has worked the best is to have a plant-rich, mildly ketogenic diet with appropriate periods of fasting. Here's why. You need to become insulin sensitive and you need to be able to make both ketones. What happens to us as we get over 40, for many of us, is that we lose both the ability to metabolize glucose in our brains and we lose the ability to make and utilize ketones. And the reason is because you have this insulin resistance. So literally, you can see this on a PET scan. The hallmark of Alzheimer's and pre-Alzheimer's, by the way, so you can see it coming for years, on an FDG PET scan is reduced glucose utilization in the temporal and parietal lobes. That's the hallmark. So it's showing you right away you are not metabolizing glucose appropriately. Now, the problem is because as you get this insulin resistance, the insulin is high, right? So that prevents you from making ketones. So now your brain is in an energetic emergency. You are not making, a, you're, not, you're not utilizing the glucose that you have. Your insulin is chronically high, and now you're not allowed to make ketones. So what we want to do is restore your ability to make ketones and to utilize glucose by making you insulin sensitive and restore your ability to make ketones. What we recommend at the beginning, just take some exogenous ketones because your brain is in this energetic slump. You need them. And so, and then you get, you have appropriate periods of fasting, typically 12 to 16 hours at night, but be careful if someone is frail you want to uh, you want to work up to that slowly and just again just take the exogenous ketones the reason you don't just eat a bunch because you're saying look hey we're not getting enough support just eat a bunch well the problem there is you just stay insulin resistant so we're trying to do two things it's a bit paradoxical we're trying to create insulin sensitivity by having some periods of fasting and using appropriate diet low in carbs but we're also trying to give you ketones and ultimately the ability to go back and forth uh, and be metabolically flexible because that's what's worked the best. And yes, we want to have appropriate 
amino acids, appropriate yeah. fats. So we typically use a high fat, good uh, intermediate uh, protein and low carb and, and very, very low simple carb diet. Now, as you said, it, it is plant rich. So you're going to get the complex carbs. That's fine. Uh, and so and the another thing, by the way, we're running across, which is very much related, is that people are getting hypoglycemic in the middle of the night. And when you do CGM, suddenly like, oh, my gosh, now you're seeing, wait a minute, I'm waking up at 3 a.m. with a glucose of 42. That's not good for your brain either. So again, we want to be able to make this system work together. Sure. Sounds incredible. You know, in terms of nutrition, I think being an important lever. Do you recommend, I know that sarcopenia is such a problem as you get older and people can't maintain muscle mass, that I look at my 19-year-old son now and I look at him and say, okay, he's got to develop serious muscle size. He can mm -hmm. afford now for his insulin to be a bit higher to activate mTOR more than cyclic AMPK, really develop your muscle size and then try and maintain your size as you get, you know, older through resistance training so that you can forfeit to a certain degree and getting into sort of a, a low calorie diet where you now producing ketones and your body can actually, you know, use these ketones and you've got metabolic flexibility. Because I'm finding with my older patients, older clients to maintain muscle size is fundamentally important. But to do yeah. that takes a significant diet, which is often not giving them space to produce ketones and be sort of get into that ketogenic state. They're taking too many saturated fats, which doesn't allow them to produce endogenous ketones. Is it the endogenous ketones that are the most important? Is it exogenous? How would you sort of marry this process of mTOR and AMPK and the process of maintaining your muscle mass? Yeah, it's such a good point because you have to remember you know, you don't get something for nothing, you know, so if you're going with the let's essentially mimic hibernation, let, let's mimic, let's essentially do what came, this came from C. elegans, nematodes, and all the beautiful work uh, over the years. So, you know, the, 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 this approach uh, is essentially making you so that your metabolism supports a long life. But that approach is not going to give you big muscles. If you're going for something that's going to give you, you know, you're going to be a power lifter. You're not going to be going for, uh, you know, for essentially a caloric restriction diet. So, you know, let's let, let's remember that this is a complex system. So you can kind of decide what do you what you want to do. I like your idea. You're going to essentially build up some muscles earlier, and then to some extent, you're going to you're going to keep it going, but you're not going to make that your primary goal. Yeah, I think you know again as we get a little bit older, um, it's not the primary goal. The primary goal then is to is to have a long health span, which doesn't go along with being muscle bound. Yeah. Um, so fine to have some muscles. Of course, as you know, the muscles have many positive benefits, many yeah. benefits, such as uh, being insulin sensitive. Yeah. So it helps you to be more insulin sensitive. Yeah. But you're you're thinking about mTOR, you're thinking about AMPK, you're thinking about SIRT1. Um, these things are all critical for longevity. Mm. So I agree that there th there is too much of this sarcopenia and too little of overall getting all the right amino acids to mm. keep this going. And again, from our standpoint, where we're simply asking, how do we make your brain function the best? You know, we're going back to, yes, you can get all these things. Go ahead and take them. I have no problem. If you're going to move up on the protein, we're typically more around one instead of two, as you said, and even above uh, two grams per kilogram, um, then, then okay, um, then you're going to have to kind of keep an eye on, are you, are you having any issues with sarcopenia? And importantly, are you absorbing it? For a lot of people, yeah. they're taking enough protein. They're just not absorbing it yeah. because they actually they're either doing poorly with their gastric acid pH uh, or they're doing poorly with their enzymes. So, okay, you can address that to mm. improve their, uh, their metabolism. Uh, but yes, you know, I think it's amazing. You can do so much looking at metabolism to mm. get the right amino acids and get to get the right fats mm. and to to basically to change your immune status and mm. to give you appropriate energy and appropriate bulk and so forth and so forth and so on 
Valid point, valid point. Last two questions. I know we, we're almost out there, but I've seen a lot of my patients and clients who've had surgeries with long anesthetics of 45 minutes to 60 minutes. This is a personal question. I've seen it empirically. I haven't looked at the data, but their children come to me and say, listen, doc, since my mother's had hip surgery, cognitively, she's just declined. Is there something with regards to anesthetic and, you know, this cognitive ability that people do, you know, in their later lives sort of lose by having these surgeries and anesthetics? Such a good point. We see it all the time. I agree with you. Uh, and uh, we have a piece in the book and also on the Apollo website about uh, one of the guides to look at, you know, all, what are all the things you can do? So lots of stuff. So when you have when you have anesthetic, number one, you've added toxin to your system uh, and often an overwhelming amount very quickly. Number two, you often will have a little bit of hypoxia during the surgery. Um, they, you may, they may just not keep this up if you're going with general anesthesia. Number three, you often have hypoperfusion during that time because they will let your blood pressure drift down. And for, for many people, they, they need the blood pressure that they have. They're, they're used yeah. to that sort of system. So all these different things that are damaging, plus number four, it's a stress. So all these things that are the things that we know result in cognitive decline. So what we recommend is if you're going to go through surgery, number one, talk to the surgeon and the anesthesiologist to ask, is this something that could be done under local or regional so that you can avoid the, uh, you can avoid the general anesthetic? Uh, number two, find out if you're going to do general anesthetic, make sure your glutathione is up to snuff ahead of time. You know, take some sulforaphane, take some liposomal glutathione or some S-acetyl glutathione. Make sure you're in good shape there. Make sure your vitamin C um, is up to snuff. Make sure that you're, you're ready for this. And then the next thing is talk to the anesthesiologist ahead of time and say, you know, don't drop the pressure, don't drop the perfusion, please, because these are important. Make sure the oxygenation is good. And then as soon as you get out of that, minimize the time. And then as soon as you get out of that, get back to, again, pouring on more glutathione, vitamin C. And again, we have a whole uh, a whole protocol okay. for how to go into and come out of anesthesia to end up with uh, optimal cognition. Mm. Brilliant. Last point, biohacks, cold plungers, infrared sauna. What is your favorite thing? Or what are the number of things that you think can improve cognitive performance? Yeah, my gosh. So, you know, we were all told that there's there's nothing in the armamentarium, nothing is going to you know, going to delay cognitive decline or prevent it or reverse it. Nothing could be further from the truth. And it depends. For those who need more mitochondrial function, cold plunges are great. Uh, and although you know the Wim Hof sort of approaches are wonderful, uh, and you know getting even getting into a sauna and then getting into a cold pool and back in the sauna, those sorts of things. Uh, helping and even things like PQQ, uh, very helpful for supporting mitochondria. And then, of course, supporting mitochondrial functions, things like NAD. Uh, all those things are very, very helpful. On the other hand, for many of us, the rate limiting problem, and as we work with these people, we start to see what their rate limiting mm. problem is or are. And what we find is that many of them, it's just they're stressed to the max. And as long as you've got, they, as long as you have that stress threat, uh, and uh, this is uh, something that Dr. Clausen has talked about in, on his uh, on his podcasts and YouTube lectures. Mm -hmm. um, very important point. As long as you've got that stress threat going on, your amygdala is, is saying, "Oh, I see a threat." That is one of the things that gets your uh, that, that gets your innate immune system to be on high alert. So you can put it on high alert with saturated fats. You can put it on high alert with mental, uh, you know, mental uh, aggression and, and, and threat because you're literally concerned about it. You can do it by any sort of stress, trauma, any of those things. They will all ultimately give you an increased risk for cognitive decline. Cool. Thank you so much. What an action-packed episode full of application. I really wanted to make practical the tests that need, people need to do, what they can do in terms of diet, 
and nutrition and just lifestyle and sleep. So thank you so much. I want to declare favor and blessing over you, Dr. Dell. You've been an inspiration. You've written courageously. Your calling is so amazing. You, you know, I just, I'm just thankful because I take your book, I give it to people and I share it with physicians. I'm part of the South African Society of Integrative Medicine. Hopefully we can do a webinar or try and get there. I'll share the podcast there. I'll link, uh, we'll do snippets and that and put all the links in the show notes and then tag you on Instagram. I know you're on Instagram put some incredible studies out there so thank you so much uh, i just hope you got many more years of you and many more books in you and many more trials in you so i really appreciate it thank you steve let's all make Alzheimer's optional which is exactly what it should be now <laughs>